back, folks, to the WP Tonic Show. This is episode 518. We've got a returning guest. He, he, he did a great job when he came on the show for the first time. We've got Paul Toby back on the show. So, Paul, would you like to quickly introduce yourself to the new listeners and viewers? Sure. I'm uh, Paul Toby. I run a digital marketing agency and training company and do executive consulting for established businesses. That's great. And we're going to be talking about how you can build a brand, a small company online, how you can still build a brand in 2020. And we're going to also going to be talking about the power of copywriting to hypnotize your leads. Um, that sounds interesting, doesn't it? Um, I've got my great um, co-host with me, Adrian. Adrian, would you like to quickly introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. My name is Adrian. I am the CEO and founder of Groundhog. We help small businesses launch their funnel, grow their list, and scale their business. And before we go into the main part of our interview with Paul, I just want to mention one of our great sponsors, and that's Kinsta. Kinsta has been sponsoring the show for almost over three years now. Um, they're a great hosting company. They only specialize in WordPress. If you've got a site, a WooCommerce site, a learning management system, a course membership site, for yourself or for clients, you really need quality hosting and that's what you get from Kinsta. They based all their technology on Google Cloud. You get a superb interface and you get great support as well. So if that sounds interesting, go over to them, have a look at their plans. I suggest that you should buy one and at the same time, tell them that you heard about them on the WP Tonic Show. So Paul, Let's start about how you build a, a small company can build a brand because um, especially online, there, there seems to be new companies starting almost every day where well, there are um, new Facebook adverts. It's a very competitive, congestive, but can, can a small company still kind of build a little niche and brand in 2020, Paul? Not instantaneously. It takes a little bit of effort and time. I like to break things down into measurable bite-sized chunks. I had a mentor once called Brian Clemmer and he said, how do you eat an elephant? And the answer is one bite at a time. Essentially, if a company is trying to break through into the market, establish a brand, establish themselves as a competitor in a specific niche, or niche, it's important to look at that from three perspectives. The first one is, is that I believe the definition of brand is promises delivered. Honoring your commitments. Essentially, if you make a promise to the marketplace and you overpromise and under deliver, that will erode brand from the get go. So brand is essentially created over time by delivering on your promises. Number two, in your messaging, you must, and this is super important, be consistent. So for example, if you, Jonathan Denwood, as a social influencer, have been doing episode, what is this, 500 and? 516. 516. I would consider that to be consistent. Would you? <laughs> um, I think it's slightly bonkers, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's important that you pick your times, you pick your social channels, you, you, you spend uh, your efforts on a consistent and measured basis over time. This will tend to help prop up the brand. It won't help you deliver on your promises, but essentially when someone ends up being a client and you deliver on your promises, then essentially they will talk about it on the social channels that you are already on. And that's what's super important. And I see that happening with Groundhog and I see that happening with other companies. So that's important. Uh, number three, you have to properly leverage communication channels. I think the most important communication channel that you have is with your clients directly. And that means utilizing a CRM to its fullest extent, staying in front of them, making sure that there are trigger points that the CRM is doing that you just don't have time to do. And of course, also keeping up your social influence as a communication channel. So those three things, one, deliver on your promises, two, 
be consistent in your messaging, and three, leverage your communication channels. Before I put it over to Adrian, do you think also a lot of this is subconscious? Like you got to, you got everything. Everything's got to match. You know, the, 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 like you say, um, you serve how you respond to support questions, your marketing. It all has to be, which is really difficult. It always has to be consistent and on message because you're kind of dealing with client people's subconscious. Does that make any sense, Paul? Uh, not totally, but I think I understand what you're trying to get at. Yeah, people, people are essentially overwhelmed by all of the noise that's online. So your, your question was, how does a company build a recognized and powerful brand online? You have to be different. You have to stand out. And difference means uh, the, the three things that I talked about. And essentially what will happen is people will make a decision on you, not based on their conscious thinking, but on their subconscious thinking, which subconscious is like 90% of the brain, which basically uh, psychologically filters everything. So they're going to filter everything you say through this subconscious mind, which judges and looks and compares. And that's basically what the subconscious mind does based on history and memory. It compares what you're saying to everything it understands and knows, and it's looking for differences. How does this compare to this? For example, when I was a jazz musician for like 23 years, when they would write about me in the newspaper as I was on tour in various places, typically what the reviewers would do is they, they'd compare my playing to another performer. They would say, well, he plays a lot like Oscar Peterson, or he's got a right hand like Oscar Peterson, and uh, a left hand like Dave Brubeck. Does that make sense? Does. And that's how people, that's how the subconscious mind works. It, it, it typically tries to find the differences between what you're saying and what it recognizes. Right, that's great. Over to Adrian. So you mentioned uh, earlier on that part of, part of brand is delivering on your promises. How, how would a business actually going about figuring out what it is that they're promising. I not, it's not always obvious, you know, as a, as a software company, uh, in my early days, we did, you know, we thought the promise was we'll just deliver great software, but that's not really what we're doing. The, the promise is the end result of using our great software to accomplish some sort of result. And, and we further define that as launching your funnel, growing your list and scaling your business. That's our promise to you when, when you use our stuff is we're gonna help you accomplish those three things. Not just the fact that, you know, we're gonna deliver you great software. So how does, a, how does a business who might be in that mindset where they think the product is the end yeah. promise in and of itself go through the process of actually figuring out what they're, what they're, what they're delivering? Yes, you are correct, Mr. Toby. Essentially, um, you don't sell cars. We don't sell cars. We sell luxury. We sell convenience. We sell affordability. We sell economics. We, we don't sell cars. We sell speed. Does that make sense? And I think a lot of companies in the beginning, when you're putting together some kind of market strategy, you have to decide what it is we're really selling. In fact, the first time I ever heard that was from Dr. Robert Anthony. He's a, a great psychologist and a uh, person you know, wrote something called the secret psychology of persuasion. And I think most companies don't necessarily land on it in the beginning, but over time they kind of figure out what it is, they're, what problem they're solving or how they're actually helping. So I think the best place to start if you're doing that is to maybe pick up a book by Bob Bloom called Inside Advantage. Uh, I've done a great study of, of this particular process uh, in addition to other, other things like, you know, vision and mission, purpose, core values. But, but from a marketing standpoint, if you're trying to create a message, and this will lead into some things that I want to talk about later that would, you mentioned copywriting. This is very important because it's basically a four-step process that Bob Bloom lays out. It's like, who is our target audience? So it's basically four things. Who, uh, what, how, and own it. And the who part is who is our target audience that, that exists in sufficient quantity to become brand loyal to us to spur profitable growth. And that's very important. If the audience must be targeted and they must be in sufficient 
quantity to spur uh, profitable growth. So who is our audience and what do they want? What is, well, what do we do that uh, solves a problem in the marketplace? It may not be necessarily what they're looking for, but that's the different differentiator. It's like, well, what do we do and, and why does that matter? And the third part is, uh, how do we do that? How do we sell our what to our who? And that's multiple marketing, uh, online, offline, everything that you do must be brand consistent and all the messaging must be consistent across multiple channels, whether you're doing books, seminars, podcasts, you name it, everything must be consistent because eventually people will learn to recognize and they like things they're familiar with. And then finally, own it. Own it means through all of those channels, you run a series of imaginative events. For example, if you take a company like Neiman Marcus, who was a one store, one, one shop, uh, high end retailer in Dallas, and basically haute couture is not, Dallas is really not the place for that because, you know, cowboy and whatever. Uh, and they had one store, but they, they, they started a, an organization called Paris in a Fortnight. So every 14 days during the hottest months of the year, they would run this Paris in a Fortnight thing where they would have people exhibiting art, they would have a concert in the park, and interspersed with that, they would do runway shows. Eventually, Neiman Marcus from that became so popular that they became a global brand uh, in excess of $2 billion a year. So it, it all starts with this sort of series of imaginative events. So who, what, how, and own it. And that's, if a company is looking to figure that out, I, I would highly recommend picking up a book called Inside Advantage. What is your inside advantage? What is your uncommon offering in the marketplace? Because it doesn't matter what's better. Better is subjective. For example, Jägermeister. <laughs> if you've ever had Jägermeister, my personal opinion is it's not a great alcohol. I prefer a good glass of scotch or a nice glass of wine. Uh, Jäger is kind of like harsh and whatever, but it has one skew and it, it's a very, very profitable com company. Why? It's different. It's not better. It's just different. And, and that's what companies need to figure out. And Inside Advantage is a good place to start. All oh, right. Is that, oh, is it over to me, Adrian? <laughs> right. Yes, it is. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, it's not easy. I, I, I remember I um, read the history of North Face um, and Patagonia. They're both outdoor brands, outdoor clothing. North Face was started by a couple in San Francisco and they developed their brand initially um, through a tent. They sold tents and they sold a tent that climbers and outdoor people, mountaineers, really, um, I wouldn't say it was revolutionary, but it was clearly better than uh, what was the rest of the competition on the market. And then they slowly went into other outdoor products. And in the end, they were bought by a very large Belgium multi-international clothing company. Patagonia, similar, um, you know, so both, you know, Pat Patagonia's, um, it's the environmental outlook. It's, you know, you, if you buy a Patagonian, if it gets torn or damaged, you can send it back and they repair it for free. You know, um, they're quite expensive, but, you know, um, they're seen as their products will last a long time and you've got this free repair service. So is it kind of um, finding, you know, having a good product, but also offering something that the competition, like what Patagonia is doing about, you can send the products back for life of the product and that they will attempt to repair it. I think that's a good example of honoring your commitments and, and brand as promises delivered. So if they're basically offering an unconditional money back guarantee, that's what we call in the business risk reversal. You're taking the risk off the, off the purchaser and you're putting it on yourself. And it has, that promise by the way, has been eroded by marketers over the year. But if you can actually offer that, I think that's a great way to 
reach your market, get them to understand that you're taking the risk and they're, they're not. And whatever problem that it solves, hopefully when they get it, it'll solve their problem and they won't return it. Basically, my experience with that is less than 5% returns across the board. It doesn't matter. Well, it's not it exactly is. returns. What they offer is if it gets damaged or torn, you can send it back to them and they repair it for free. Yeah, it's, it's, like, um, it's like the, the sunglasses company. Uh, yes, I know what you mean, yeah. Adrian, name of the sunglasses company? I know ray Bans? No. Not no, ray uh, internet, haven't they? It doesn't matter where you buy them. It doesn't even matter if you buy them secondhand. You take them into any store and they will replace uh, what's broken on them. Yes. It doesn't matter if it you sat on them it's basically they just have this sort of lifetime guarantee on their on their sunglasses which is kind of neat right? it's different as they say very, very different <laughs> yeah well we're going to go for a break when we come back we're going to be talking about hypnotic copywriting we'll be back in a few moments folks we're coming back we had a discussion about branding and how you how do you build a brand? Not the most easiest thing, but it's important when you're a small company. So, Paul, hypnotic copywriting, what's this about, Paul? But before you jump into that, you asked me. Oh, to yes, thank, yes, thank you so much. I almost forgot there. I've got to discuss our second sponsor. Um, that's WP Fusion. And WP Fusion, if you've got um, a CRM like Active Campaign, Drip, um, Infusionsoft um, and you're looking for a powerful and effective way for your WordPress website to communicate with one of these CRMs you need WP Fusion what it enables you to do with, with one of these modern marketing optimization platforms is amazing it's an amazing company that's established a clear brand in the past three years um, that they've been on and off sponsoring the show for over the past three years. Their support is much appreciated. But let's get to the crux of it. If you've got a client or you, or for yourself, you need your WordPress website to communicate with these CRMs, you need WP Fusion. So go over there, have a look at their packages, buy one, and tell them that you heard about them on the WP Tonic show. So hypnotic copywriting what's this about paul well it all stems from the number one challenge that companies have when it comes to putting up marketing messages especially online it tends to be the one area that gets missed or overlooked or underestimated in terms of its value in creating a website so for example most people would put their efforts into design and does it match the company brand and they would put a lot of time and effort in the logo as if a logo is actually going to sell something words sell and i think people underestimate or have completely underestimated the value of that in terms of connecting with an audience so we talked a little bit earlier about brand is promises delivered but we also talked about being consistent in communication and being being a powerful communicator and persuader is an important element in reaching an audience. And when they come to your website, they're basically reading words, headlines, subheadlines, bullet points, things like that. And if you piece them together without any knowledge of how people's psychology or the psychology of persuasion actually works, then your marketing messaging tends to miss the mark. So I've made a great study over the years of people like Joe Vitale, Gary Bensivenga, P.T. Barnum, uh, Robert Cialdini, Dan Kennedy. So some of the great copywriters of our time. And I think there's a consistent message that they all share. And that is words can put people into a focused mental state, subconscious that we talked about earlier, that is completely... Uh, curiosity driven where the only thing that matters is what do I do next and that's what we call a good user experience they come to the website you capture their attention and interest you explain to them uh, 
as quickly as possible what the benefits are, but basically create enough curiosity so that they're so curious, the tipping point is, do I buy or don't I buy? And hypnotic copywriting can help push somebody over the edge. So that's essentially what hypnotic copywriting is, putting people into a focused mental state, building curiosity, where the only thing that happens is what comes next. Yeah, I've got to tell you, it still is a weakness, but um, it was a major weakness for me reflecting back. But I have got an excuse, Paul. I, I, I have dyslexia. So I'm a very visual person, video, images, that's what got me into web design initially with Dreamweaver. Um, I'm really dating myself now. But, oh, no, um, I, I, I've been you're talking to someone who started uh, digital marketing back when no one had ever heard of it. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of Dreamweaver in the early days. Yeah. Um, but I realized recently, um, so I joined a course by, a, I don't know, you know this guy, Frank Kern? Yes. Um, and he talks about all the people that you've just uh, mentioned, old copywriters in, um, in the day of print, newspaper print and magazines. And um, he went, he actually threw the course that I purchased. I don't normally purchase these type of courses, but it was at a very affordable price. So I bought it and I did learn because he was actually... Um, he was actually launching a brand, an online brand, for his wife who, who wanted to sell cosmetic, to build a cosmetic brand. And he showed, he went through all the process of writing the copywriting, um, getting an initial uh, batch of um, goods, how to do videos, and how to start building a brand online. It was fascinating, actually. But his emphasis was copywriting, like what you've just said. Over to you, Adrian. So uh, what are kind of like the three, if you could choose three, what are the three main elements that you would use to capture that initial intention? Because from you know, years and years and years of research, the you have like, what, seven seconds or 13 seconds to capture someone's interest when they land on your homepage from either like a Google ad or a Facebook ad, or maybe just organic search. What's, what are the, what are the three first things that they need to see in order to give you the time to stick around within that seven seconds using hypnotic copywriting techniques? And do you want to talk about that in the context of say a web page or a landing page? Yes. Okay. So the first thing is, uh, the headline is the most important element. You can have a pre-headline and you can have sub-headline, but the main headline should be front and center and don't overwrite that with, with, with images because while people say, well, you know, images paint a thousand words, we don't want them to paint a thousand. We want, we want to paint the words that we choose, not what images choose. So words can paint very specific images. And so the first thing is, is that people think in pictures. And to prove that, all you have to do is watch what your brain does when I list things. So let, let's go watch what your brain does. Okay, so computer, chair, desk, floor, tree, road, car, sun, moon, sky, clouds. What did it do? Every single instantaneously, the brain immediately, without any hesitation, visualized every single word in the brain. So people underestimate the power of people thinking in pictures. And so the, the words that you choose must paint a picture and then lace it secondly with emotion, must make them feel something. So fast car, <laughs> green tree, high, high uh, bright sun, strong sun, uh, hot sun, everything that kind of creates some type of feeling associated with the imagery. That's what we call hypnotic connectors, connecting the imagery with a feeling. And then the third thing is, is that uh, the reason why this would be the probably interspersed with those first two things, the reason why I need it, the reason you're the best one to give it to me and the reason why I should buy that now. So to me that if you, if you follow that formula, people think in pictures, 
people make them feel something and give them the reasons why the reasons why they need it the reasons why you're the best one to give it to me and the reason why i should buy it today so that's how i would start uh visualizing the entire landing page based on those things doesn't mean there aren't many other elements that you can use such as you know bogo which is the biggest selling offer of all time in fact if you look at bogo buy one get one free versus half price and versus um uh, half price and uh, the other one was 50 percent off so buy one get one free half price and 50 percent off all mean the same thing so why is it buy one get one free gets 86 percent better response than the other two and the answer is people like value that's piled on so they, they'd rather buy value than than get something at a discount discount so that's how that works does that answer your question adrian Yes, it does. Thank you, Jonathan. Two other factors that come to mind um, that I've been thinking about recently when it comes to copywriting, Paul, is um, you've got to find the vocabulary of your target audience, how they talk, different groups of people. You know, if you get a group of CPAs and then you get a group of online marketers in two separate rooms, it's going to be English, but it's going to be two very different conversations, isn't it? And the second thing is really, and I'm not sure this, this word actually exists, but I created it. Um, that's Nicheify. That that's really being brutal and finding an audience and then cutting it and cutting it and cutting it, it because. The more you nicheify, as long as you don't make it ridiculous, where there's only like five people in the world that could buy your product, is that you're dealing with all, you know you know the most of North America, Canada, and most of Europe, and that could be even bigger depending on your price point. Um, is really nicheifying, and that really helps with the copywriting and making it more targeted what did you think of those two points paul so the first one was talking about speaking the language of your audience i i think that's important it it also depends on its product or service and yeah. and, and obviously speaking the language of your audience is super important but what i've always found is is not necessarily dumb it down but speak in common language and colloquialisms and if there are specific colloquialisms for that audience, use them regularly. Common phraseology that they use. I think, especially if you're dealing with a, a highly intelligent audience, you certainly don't want to underestimate their intelligence and, and speak at a grade eight level. You can speak a bit higher than that. But at the same time, you don't want to make it overly complicated, which is essentially just trying to make yourself look like a good writer. And I think good writers tend to bury themselves. I, an English degree from university does not make you a good business copywriter. We're, we're, I'm talking about salesmanship in print. So yeah, if you're speaking to an audience and you're delivering information and you're writing uh, the, the, the New England Journal of Medicine, that's a very different thing than it is to try to sell a widget to somebody on, to, to a million people online. So common language, colloquialisms, phraseology, stick to what, stick to like a grade eight level of speech. So that's the first one. Uh, the second one, it just remind me quickly what it was. My brain. It was the like, niche of fine even more right. than what you think you should. It's very simple in business actually to, to create a business. People I think overestimate uh, the, the uniqueness of their business. It's like, I'm doing something that nobody else does. If you're doing something that nobody else does, there's probably no market for it. <laughs> so I would suggest uh, to most people, uh, pick, a, pick a business that you can find plenty of competition because if there's plenty of competition, there's obviously an audience. <laughs> uh, I think a lot of people try to create an audience where none exists. I've done a lot of training over the years, Jonathan. I mean, literally thousands of people have come through my doors over the years and I've heard some pretty crazy business ideas and some of them you just listen to and you go, that's never going to work. You know, it's just, it's just too niche and too, 
too specific. So, but what you do is you pick a niche that's well, popular. I that's, see exactly what you mean. I, I didn't explain it. I think that you you got to find a broad market, but then you got to find a sub level of that market. Just be different. Yeah. Yeah. All you have to do. I mean, that's what the second point that I was going to make. It's like just just find a niche that's competitive, but but go into that and be different. I always think of Adrian's business as in a highly, highly, highly competitive marketplace. And he knows, and maybe Adrian can speak to this, he knows that he's, he's not after everyone. He's not after the whole market. He's after a specific niche in that market that, un, that, that uh, is different. You know, what makes Adrian different? Well, first of all, it's, it's the first and only one for WordPress. Really, that's, that's worth any value. Uh, it does what the, the big CRM companies do at a fraction of the cost. So he, he can carve out a, a fairly large audience out of that with Groundhog because it's just, it's clearly different. And I know because I, I worked with Infusionsoft and MailChimp and, and GetResponse and, you know, back in the days of AutoResponse Plus version three that nobody's ever heard of. There's one that even dates your what was it you mentioned earlier? Dates Dreamweaver. 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 Like, come, seriously, like, I mean, this stuff's been around forever. And, you know, Adrian knew, like, that market exists. He's been working in it a, a long time. And he, he picked a product and a, and, a, and a way to go about it that's clearly different. And that company will have great legs in the coming years. Right. That's great. Over to you, Adrian. Oh, I think we better, actually, we better actually um wrap up our podcast part of the show um hopefully paul you're going to stay on for some bonus content on your poll so paul's staying on for some bonus content which you'll be able to watch on the wp tonic youtube channel and on the wp tonic website with a full transcription of the interview so paul how can people find out more about you and your thoughts and what you're up to so the best place to find out about me is on a website called thatsambitious.com. It is a online learning site where people can have over a hundred hours of very specific content on how to run several aspects of their business, including marketing and digital marketing, but there's many, many other things there. And if they use the coupon code WPTONIC, they can get 50% off any of our subscriptions. I hope you built it on WordPress, but I'm not going to ask of, you. Not... Of, of course. <laughs> right. WordPress uh, um, and Groundhog. <laughs> right. Uh, um, Adrian, how can people find out more about you and what you're up to? Yeah, so if uh, you have gone to That's Ambitious and you've taken their courses and now you're an expert hypnotic copywriter, you have a lot, bunch of leads that you need something to do with. We have the marketing automation and CRM tools that will allow you to grow your list and scale your business by constantly keeping up uh, consistent communication with your audience in order to further grow revenue and expand. That's great. And um, we, I am doing a free webinar with Chris Badger, the CEO of Lifter LMS on the 4th of August. That's Tuesday, the 4th of August at 9 a.m., Pacific Standard Time. And basically, um, if you're looking to build your first online course membership website and sell your experience um, to the world, basically, um, Lifter LMS is one of the cheapest and best ways of doing it. Um, almost everything is free that you need that comes with the core of Lifter. And then you just need to buy one extension for Stripe at $99. And off you go. And we will be, me and Chris will be showing you how to build a, a learning membership website in one hour. And then you'll be able to take some money. Um, and that doesn't sound too bad, does it? So join us for that free webinar. Um, and we'll see you next week. But remember, we've got some bonus content with Paul, which you can see the quickest on the WP tonic youtube channel we we'll see you soon folks bye so on to bonus content so anything on your radar when it comes to marketing automation or general marketing that you think was a little bit interesting and unique recently paul 
So I like the way that, uh, and again, I, I'm a little biased here, but I like the way that Groundhog is handling the lifter LMS and the learn dashes of the world. Um, those are typically not uh, email marketing systems. They are, it's, it's a way of managing and organizing video content and courses and uh, quizzes and you know homework online. It's basically you're, you're trying to deliver content in a real and meaningful way. It's a great platform. Any, any learning management system, especially the ones for, learn, for WordPress, uh, work really well. Well, I think we've but got what to, they don't, what they don't do to, is... We've got to the best ones on the market, really. Yeah. Learn Dash and Lift LMS. I think, I think they compete directly with the SASs quite easily. Yeah, I've used them both. Uh, each one of them is a little bit different. Uh, for example, that's ambitious.com was built on Learn Dash, uh, but I have a new a site launching soon called Jazz Mental, which is online piano lessons for advanced people, and it's built on Lifter. So I understand the, the core differences between the two, but what I like that Groundhog does that they don't do is it's great to offer people membership and, and learning platforms and, and great videos and everything, but getting them to actually consume them, not the easiest thing in the world. People will sign up for memberships, but after three months, if they have been making their monthly donation and they have only taken one course, uh, wherein that's ambitious, they can take 100 hours of courses in that time if they wanted to, but they just don't. So what, what Groundhog does is let's say a course has six lessons. As soon as the person enrolls in that course, if they get two lessons in and then two weeks later they haven't finished, Groundhog will automatically send them a message saying, hey, where are, you? where are you? Today's a good day to come back and finish the course. It also will do login as well. So if somebody logs into the back end and they haven't done it for seven days, Groundhog will pick up the ball and go, hey, where are you? We haven't seen you in seven days. And you can obviously set different timers. But I think that's one of the greatest uh, aspects. Uh, I have recently seen that work very well in That's Ambitious for people who are abandoning courses or not logging in for a certain period of time. So it's, it's, it's very helpful. Yeah. And I think we've probably only seen the beginning of customize, like customizing a course experience, depending on the, on the behavior of that individual in a way, I think we're really just at the beginning of the possibilities where that might go, might it, Paul? I think maybe we might be at the beginning. I, I think it could advance a little bit from here, but not by much. All right. Um, these these learning management systems, they're not communication systems. No, no, they no. basically offer the opportunity for people to log in and consume things. But like I said, that the challenge is, do they actually do that? And for example, Groundhog pays attention to that. And that's what we need to do. Because you couldn't possibly do that manually. Even LearnDash in the back end, it'll show you uh, how much like people have consumed three lessons out of seven, right? Well, what do you do with that now? Do you write that person an email on the spot? Like who's got time for that? And so just the concept of paying attention to the way people are consuming content, because if you don't pay attention, what's gonna happen is like I said, they'll just abandon their membership because they haven't done anything. Yeah, that's so true. Over to you, Adrian. It's really, it's really on the, uh, it's really on the trainer or who's ever delivering the training to keep the customers accountable for actually going through and, and, and getting their results. No results. That's when, that's when churn happens, right? So uh, churn, churn is the churn is the big enemy of of learning management. And you know, it's it's all great. And you know. Chris Badgett, bless his heart, built a great little product and I've had some conversations with him and obviously Adrian's a good friend as well. Uh, much better than I am. Uh, great system. Uh, and you mentioned, you know, you're going to show people how to build learning management online in an hour. Well, Not roughly. That, that's, that's fantastic. But what about the content and the context of that content and, and, and the workbook that goes along with it and everything? That's what people underestimate. That's the, that's the hard part. Because, you know, even Udemy, for example, and I have courses on Udemy, if you go to Udemy, it's not a walk in the park. 
to just get an account in Udemy and go, okay, this course is divided into six lessons. And then you got to go, well, are they any good? Do we have more than one camera? Did we edit it properly? Is there bookend branding? Is the context of the delivery of the content any, any good? And, uh, you know, that's what's real. And I actually have courses on helping people to do that. So if people get past Chris Badgett and they get something online, but they still don't know how to make a decent course, I've got courses to help you make a decent course. Yeah, and it's, you know, it's a similar thing with the leading SaaS platforms like Kajabi and to some extent Teachable and there's a couple of others. Um, you know, like I, I did a review on Kajabi and, I, I you know, obviously... I'm kind of committed to WordPress. It's in my blood, as you would say, but um, I don't think I lose, you know, my ra rationality. So I did a review on it and it's a great platform, but they kind of sell it because it's all, it's all on one platform. That makes it easier to set up. Uh, no. It, it may, <laughs> I, I'm it I don't really follow that logic, really. Um, I mean, it does. It does make it easier to set up, but you still kind, have to. You still have to create content. Maybe. You still have to create content, and you know what? People, I think, you know, there's content in context. I don't know if I've talked about this before, but if if you put anything inside a bowl, like let's let's take a bowl, right, and let's put some water inside of it, okay? Well, if that bowl springs a little leak, what happens to all the content that's in the bowl? Doesn't matter how big the leak is. What happens to the entire content? Runs it, it, it runs out right so what's more important than the content itself it's the framework that holds it together that's what we call context and context is far more important than content and people don't learn that they don't learn how people accept information they don't learn the psychology of persuading people to stick around and hear you out and that's what's super important about building content online and that's the tricky part right it's the context of what you say it's what you say not how it's how you say it, but not think, what you say yeah. that matters I also think, um, I know somebody, he's not a friend, but um, he's been on another podcast show that I do. And he did a course using ClickFunnel uh, about four, about five, six years ago. And it it was mostly videos um, in, Click, in um, ClickFunnels, because ClickFunnels does a membership element. It's It's not up to Kajabi or what, WordPress can offer listeners and viewers, but um, it and he did it in there, and it was in a particular niche area, and he was the first to do a course that showed people how to do face Facebook marketing, and it's like six seven years ago, and um, he managed to get one of those click hunt, click funnel silver discs like a million sales. And it's a, it's the most basic course you've ever seen, but it's he was he kind of produced it at the right time, at the right moment, on the right platform, and he knew how to do Facebook advertising, and he made himself a load of money. Paul, I'm always amazed at people who can just instantaneously create uh, some type type of wave. I had a friend in my life; his name was. Uh, Joe Burley and Joe said, you know, Paul, in life, you'll always get, you'll get two waves and each of those waves, you must ride them for as long as humanly possible. And I'm always surprised at people like that and amazed that they can just land on something like that. And the, the cash just flows in. I've, I haven't actually seen that in my life. I'm more of a consistent creator yeah, and I've right. created consistency of cash flow over the years. And I've helped, a, but I have helped a lot of companies make a lot of money. Trust me on that one. Uh, when I tell you, because I, I always thought maybe if I had taken a percentage in their company rather than just get paid, things would have been very different. Uh, but I am amazed and it does happen. And you can, the, the challenge though is, is that person is one in a million. There that person is one yeah. in 500,000 in the click yeah. funnel system. And that's the person that they promote, obviously. Yeah. That's the person they give the awards to. And yeah. of course, everybody jumps in thinking, oh, it's easy. I just create this simple little course and I'll be a millionaire overnight because they see somebody else do it. It's like kind of like winning the lottery, you know, it's yeah. like, yeah. 
And I, I bet if you talk to that person, have you, have you interviewed that person directly? Yeah, on my other podcast. Yeah, yeah. but um, we. And did what did he have to say about that? Like, did he? Did he? Did I he never. Feel like I never completely... asked him. I never asked him ab- about that actually, um, because we've become two competitors. We've got we got a CR system in the same area, which I didn't know at the time he was developing, but he did it in a much more logical, better way than I did. He. He actually got an audience through his training, online training, and then he built his own CRM um, that linked to Facebook to market to those people. He was much more logical and saved himself a lot of money where I just kept opening my wallet to um, build it. Uh, um, But I was a bit naive at the time. I didn't realise I got sucked in gradually. It was either give up on a very basic product that I initially thought I was doing or which I found out really didn't have a lot of value to its target audience. It's a bit like courses. I'm amazed people don't really kind of do a landing page and, and do a pre launch special offering just to find out and and try and market it to its target audience, just to find out, that there's a there's a demand for what they're trying to sell because they don't do their market validation no but almost all people in courses paul that i know they don't do that paul um and it's not very hard to do now is it paul what do you think about that oh you're muted actually paul it reminds me of when i first uh put uh, my piano lessons online way back in say 2005, I think it was. Wow. Uh, because I was marketing sheet music online at the time. Oh yeah. I remember you saying that. Yeah. Yes. And then, you know, Joe Vitale basically said, listen, you're, you're not going to make a lot of money selling $7 at a time or $5 at a time for a piece of sheet music. He's like, what can you develop? That's higher value, like $500. And all I did was I sent an email out to my list and I said, listen, if I could, if I could offer you something, what would it be? And they all said, listen, we, we like your sheet music. It's really hard to play. Um, can you teach us to play like you? And I'm like, maybe, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, so I put a web page up, said, uh, learn to improvise in 10 weeks or less guaranteed by professional concert jazz pianist, Paul Toby, coming soon. <laughs> Uh, give me your email address and I'll let you know when it's ready. And I didn't even start making those courses until there was 500 people on the list. And then uh, when it came launch time, there was 3,300 people on the list. And I just basically fired off an email saying instead of, you know, $500 is $249 and I'll give you every single piece of sheet music in my online store. That's a $500 value or whatever. And my phone just started ringing off the hook. So I I think that's a form of market validation. It's a very easy thing to throw up a web page and ask for people's email address in exchange for uh, a discount or being notified on something that's coming. Yeah, but it's just, I'm just amazed at the amount of people. And obviously it doesn't apply to everybody because some people have kind of established themselves in a certain marketplace with a certain audience, haven't they? So that doesn't quite apply to them. But I think even for those, it's still probably a good idea, isn't it? Because you don't you don't really want to invest a load of time or money in making all these courses and just find out they're just they're not interested, are they? It's not only a good idea; it's an essential idea. Uh, it, there is a lot of work. If if you go to that'sambitious.com, you can see how much effort and time was put in. I mean, we've been recording uh, two hour courses for over a year now. That's a lot of work. And if, if we uh, took the position that if you build it, they will come, I, I can tell you the thing wouldn't work at all. It's really all about communication methods and all of the brand promises that we talked about earlier. Uh, but yeah, it's, 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 everything is a work in progress, Jonathan. <laughs> And you got to stay on top of it. You got to, you can't, I, I, you know, more power to the people who can throw out an ebook and make a million dollars. I wasn't one of those people. <laughs> well, it's like what you were saying, you know, the example I gave 
It's a guy called Grant Wise, actually. He has got the, he has a podcast in the real estate training area, and he has got the. He's a very likable person, and he has the gift of the gab, as I would say. Uh, um, he's a good salesman, and um, he got into Facebook advertising for real estate really exactly at the right moment. But he also had the vision to go for it and build that first course. Um, so I wish him well, but he, you know, he made a lot of money from it, but good luck to him. Hey. All right, then. Perfect. Here we go. Um, great having you back on the show, Paul. You have to come back a bit uh, sooner than last time. I think we've had a good discussion. Thanks for your knowledge. Thank you, Adrian. And we'll be back next week with another great guest. We've got some really great guests coming on the show, uh, coming in August. I've managed to book all of August up with guests, and we've got already booked a couple of people for September. And I think it's going to be some great shows, folks. We'll see you soon. Bye. Thank you.